Hello friends. This is Subhant What Ifs. So in this video we will see what if Naruto sign a summoning contract with Dragon Clan. Here is quick summary. Only one with a pure heart can sign the summoning contract of the Dragon Clan, and only one with a pure heart can become the partner of a Dragon Hatchling. Yuzumaki Naruto is about to find out how true old quotes can be. Check out the other details of this movie given in this description. Also be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Now let's start the story. Summoning animals was relatively common, most people had summons or partners of some sort birds, frogs, toads, dogs, wolves, snakes, bees, cats, tigers, and other creatures, just to name a few were rather common. But long ago, it was said that one who could summon a dragon was one who was truly great, and one who could befriend said dragon and make it their partner, as one might have a partnership with an ink in their comrade, perhaps true friendship was a very worthy, not to mention, a truly pure untainted soul. Of course, this was never proven, though many sought after the dragon clan in hopes of being able to befriend or rather capture a dragon in order to make it their partner or force the head dragon to let them sign the dragon clan summoning contract. Needless to say, none of those brave or more so foolish men and women came back from their journeys and it was unknown whether or not those who sought after the ancient beasts actually found what they were looking for. After a while, the ninja world just forgot about the dragons and went on with their lives, but there were still some who believed that one day, one with a pure heart would actually befriend the dragon clan and be granted the ability to sign the dragon contract and take one of the ancient beasts of legend as their partner. No one though had believed that the child shunned and despised by his own people would be the one the one that would become the dragon summoner. Uzumaki Naruto was not a very happy nor a very privileged boy. All his life, he had been shunned by the children whom he wished to befriend and despised by the adult villagers. The glares were unbearable, boring holes, figuratively, in the back of his skull as he walked by. The beatings were almost constant, but by the next day, the wounds, the scars, at least the physical ones, had disappeared from his tanned skin. He was practically at the breaking point, he could no longer bear it, and at one point or another, he wished that he would just die and end the endless suffering. But it was as if the world was playing some sort of cruel joke on the poor boy, for every time, every single time, just when he was about to die, just when it was about to end, he would be saved, and by the next morning, his body would be unmarred. At this point in his life, young Yuzumaki Naruto was only six years old, in fact, today was his sixth birthday. While any other little kid would be hopping around, cheering about it being their sixth birthday, demanding for cake and ice cream and presents, now that they were too old to be able to count their age on just one hand, Naruto was scared he was scared for his life, and while many times he had wished he would just die, he hated the glares, and more so, he hated the beatings, the names that they, the villagers and shinobi of the village, called him, and he hated, even more, the pain, physical and emotional, that they caused his frail body and mind. It hurt so bad to know that the villagers hated him for a reason that he did not know nor comprehend. As far as he knew, he had done nothing, nothing at all, to anger the villagers, especially to the extent of his punishments, as many of the villagers called it. Now, here and ran as fast as his stubby legs and frail body could take him. He was panting, sweating to the point that he looked as if he had been standing under a waterfall for the past hour, as was still doing so. His clothing, old, dirty, and many sizes too big for his small stature, were falling off his dirty, sweat-drenched body, and his feet, bare of any protection, were worn, blistered and bleeding from running for so long, and so far his small tan body was covered in cuts and bruises from earlier in the day, and he left arm dangled uselessly at his side, dripping with thick crimson blood. His spiky blonde hair drooped miserably into his eyes, streaked with his own blood. His eyes were shaded over with the very same blood-streaked hair as sheer crystalline tears flowed from his formerly happy, bright, now practically dead cerulean eyes. The crowd of angry civilians and shinobi drew menacingly close, half of them drunk beyond belief from festivities earlier in the night. Many held any weapon they could find hoes and rakes, shovels and sticks, kunai and shuriken, and even swords. They were shouting, many of them, incoherent things, while other words stood out more among the others demon, hell spawn, evil fox, kaiubi, just to name a few of the name. Why, Naruto chalked out though his tears, why do they hate me? Naruto had been running for quite some time now, and his limbs ached, and his head pounded. He was starving, tired, cold and dirty. But he felt no pain, he had become immune to it by now, yet he was only six. No six years old should have had to live through this, already, in their young life he stopped, fell to his knees, and sobbed. The mob closed in around him, and, although their yelling was very loud, it was very faint in Naruto's ears, for his own thoughts overpowered the voices of the other villagers. Why? Why do they hate me? What did I do? What did I do to deserve this punishment? When will it end? When will this suffering end? It doesn't hurt my body anymore. But my heart it hurts I wish it would go away. I just wish it would go away. Why? The darkness. The pain. Why? Why? 
All around him, the mob attacked, spouting curses, throwing things and beating him within an inch of his life. It didn't hurt, though, physically, anyway. But inside, Naruto was in turmoil. He didn't understand, maybe it was just too complicated for him to understand, in the first place. He didn't know he just wanted it, all of it, to end. The pain, the suffering, the name-calling, the hurt, the turmoil, his life when would it all just go away. It seemed like hours, yet at the same time, seconds, before the mob dissipated. The agonizing torture physical torture that went unnoticed by his numb body and even more agonizing torture mental torture had ended, leaving the poor boy both mentally and physically scarred, lying in a pool of his own thick crimson blood. At that moment that very moment if one were to look into that boy's eyes, they would have seen, not cheerful, glee-filled eyes, but cold, emotionless, dead orbs. If I die then they will be happy. And I won't be a burden to them and the old man. Elsewhere, two glowing red eyes peered into a crystalline, opaque orb. The orb was clouded over with the image of a young, dying blonde, lying in a pool of blood. The boy's thoughts projected themselves into the creatures the owner of those glowing red eyes mind. Hmm. Very interesting this human thinks not of revenge, like a normal human would his heart, despite what he has been through, is purer than any human I have ever seen, even with a demon that Shui-sama, one, sealed within him how odd. The creature watched as Naruto, though conscious, made no attempt to stand, or even sit up. He just laid there, his eyes glazed over. But this boy's spirit it's weak, and he's practically dead on the inside poor child, he has been though so much. Worthy, his soul is. The creature stopped watching and placed a hand, or rather, claw, on top of the ball, turning the cloudy crystalline ball into a completely clear ball. The creature stepped from the shadows in which he sat. The creature had scaly green skin and glowing red eyes. He was obviously taller than any normal man, but stood on its hind legs, as if it were one. He had hands, as well as the human trait of opposable thumbs, but his hands were also green and noticeable scaly, and each of his fingers, which were both thicker and shorter than a human's, was tipped with a large, very sharp black claws. The creature's neck was much longer than a human's, and the back of it was lined with very sharp yellow spikes. The creature's head and face were also both very scaly and spiky. Spikes, like the ones that lined the creature's neck, also lined his back and tail, though partially hidden by the royal blue kimono that the creature wore on its body. Lastly, poking out from two slits cut into the back of the creature's kimono, were two large, slightly transparent reptilian wings, also green in color. As well as that, the creature held an odd golden staff in his clawed hand that showed a three-fingered claw gripping a palm-sized purple orb. Across the creature's back was a large scroll, one that was old and tattered, decompassing from age. He, the creature, was a dragon, one of the clan of ancient and magnificent beasts known as the Dragon Clan. Not just that, but he was the high priest of the dragon clan, a leader and an elder among the other dragons. His name was Rai. Rai who walked through the halls of the castle complex, three, in which the dragon clan, or most of it anyway, resided. His path to his destination cleared as the younger, lower-ranked dragons of the dragon clan scurried from the path of the high priests. Finally, Rai who stopped at a large door, ten times taller than his own tall stature, and tentatively knocked on the door. A loud rumble sounded through the whole castle complex, and the large wooden doors swung inward with a loud, resounding creak. The room on the other side of the door was absolutely, positively huge. Tall crystalline spikes pierced though the shiny wood flooring, but seemed to have been there before the room had been built. There was no lighting source, yet the room was glowing brightly because of the light emitted from the all-crystalline structures that sprouted from the ground. In the back of the room, a large black creature lay on the floor, or rather, an extremely large royal blue blanket or rug. The creature's front claws were folder, and its large head sat on those folded paws. The creature was absolutely huge, even compared to Ryu. It had thick, scaly black skin and a thick, spiky mane, as well as a row of neat black spikes that ran down the large creature's back, neck and tail. The creature opened its eyes, revealing large, but bright yellow eyes, each with a slit pupil. The creature lifted its long neck and head and looked down at Ryu with half-lidded yellow eyes. What is it, Ryu-kun? The creature asked, its voice was loud, but not as deep as one would expect from such a large creature. Its voice was very feminine and was warm, like the voice of a mother. Ryu bowed to the larger dragon. Sundakuro Hikari Haim, for, I have found him, Ryu said, still bowing. The larger dragon, Sundakuro Hikari, giggled slightly. I told you, Ryu-kun, call me Kari-chan. I don't like all of those formalities. I'm not that old, in fact, you babysat me when I was just a little hatchling. The Sundakuro Hikari, now known as Kari. Kari was the princess of the Dragon Clan, as well as its leader. She was the daughter of the original King of the Dragons, who had died long ago, and the original Queen of the Dragons, who died as well, before the King. Now, tell me about him. Ryu nodded. He is a child with a pure heart, but he is about at the breaking point. 
He is not like no detested by his village, yet wants no revenge he was beaten by his villagers, so if he is the one, then we should work fast. Hari nodded and closed her eyes. Show me this child. Ryu nodded to his leader and touched the purple orb at the top of his dragon claw staff. At that point, the orb flashed with a bright light and images projected into the air. They were images of the beatings and the thoughts of the boy. The showed the boy and his eyes, the people, the village and the boy's emotions, happy and sad. Hari watched and sighed. Stop the images, Ryu kun I believe that he could be the one, Kari said, go there save the boy and give him the contract. If it doesn't reject him, we'll know if he is the one. Ryu nodded and disappeared in a poof of smoke. I know that he is the one, I can see it in his eyes, and he looks so much like him Shui Kun Kari whispered after Ryu no Hai to Kuri left. Summoning dragons was not all that different from summoning any other creature, apart from the fact that finding one that could actually summon the beasts of the dragon clan, but it had a few key differences from normal animal summoning. While in most forms of animal or beast summoning, it was key to summon a bigger, stronger creature to fight in battle for everyone knows, the bigger, the stronger, that's always why the boss is the biggest, right? Well, in dragon summoning, no matter how much chakra you put into the first try, you will always summon an egg. Not just any egg, though, a dragon egg. It was possible to summon other full-grown dragons, but only as aids in battles, the egg once it hatched, would stay with the summoner for a lifetime or more. Once the dragon egg hatched, the dragon hatchling would stay alongside their summoner, much like how an animal partnered clan, such as the Inuzuka clan of Kanahagakur no Sado, fight and live alongside their animal partners. In addition to being partnered with a dragon hatchling, a summoner would be given the markings of the dragon. Given by the high priest of the dragon clan, the markings of the dragon would show to the world that the summoner was the pure-hearted summoner of the beasts of the dragon clan and was not to be messed with. These markings were permanent and usually adorned the summoner's face, most of the time, their cheeks and forehead. It was a dreary sight. Quite depressing, actually, yet morbidly artistic. The normally blue sky was clouded over with blotches of dark gray and black, and the heavens wept sharp cold tears that rained down on the earth below. In some abandoned alleyway, within the so-called strongest of the hidden villages Kanahagakur no Sado, lay a small, half-dead child. Under him, puddled a pool of deep red, and as the rain poured down from the heavens, swirling crimson tendrils left the boy's body, drifting off to some other place as was bruised and beaten, blotched with purple and green, and crimson blood. His hair was golden, like rays of sunlight, but it was stained, saturated in the crimson of his own crimson essence, and his eyes his once beautiful bright blue eyes, were swollen shut. Over the boy's slowly dying body, stood a large green-skinned creature. The creature no the dragon, Ryu no Haidakuri, sighed. How sad a life almost ended because of the stupidity and ignorance of his own kind yet never have I laid my eyes on such a soul, worthy of the dragon summoning, to such an extent, yet so young. He kneeled down beside the injured boy and whispered an ancient incantation. From the skies fall the tears of the heavens from the trees and the dirt, the sadness of the earth heal the injured at my will, and the scales of the dragon be thy payment. Ryu placed his clawed hand over Naruto's injured form, and the body began to glow brightly with a light green aura. In a matter of seconds, all of the physical injuries that had been inflicted on Naruto's small body had healed completely. Ryu moved his claw down to Naruto's shoulder and shook him slightly. Speaking in tongue, Ryu attempted to wake the small boy. Tiled, wake up. An NGG Naruto groaned, not quite willing to rouse from his slumber. Ryu shook Naruto gently once more. Wake up. Ugh Naruto groaned, his eyelids sliding up, half revealing his seemingly soulless blue eyes. Wah. Good, child you have awoken, Ryu said sagely, still speaking in human tongue. What happened Naruto stopped speaking, his eyes widened, as all of his memories of the previous hours rushed back to him. He quickly bolted up and backed away, his cerulean eyes squeezed closed tightly. He pushed his arms in front of himself, in an X shape, in an attempt to block any attacks. Please don't hurt me he whimpered. Ryu chuckled slightly, and placing a clawed hand on the boy's head, ruffled the blonde's blood-streaked hair. I won't hurt you, silly child quite on the contrary, actually I healed you, and now, I'm here to give you something very special. That's something very as special. Naruto asked meekly. Yes child. Very special. You see, child, my name is Ryu no Hodakuri, I am the high priest of the dragon clan. The dragon clan? Ah yes, the dragon clan. I am a dragon, and I wish to offer you something. Naruto stared at the elder dragon and nodded, not sure what to say. Once every hundred or so years, we dragons come across a very worthy soul, a person with pure heart and soul that is untainted with hatred. It is rare that we find such a person, but if and when we do, we allow this person to sign a contract, a summoning contract with the dragon clan. And forever, will this person be linked to the dragons, and in battle and in life, this summoner of the dragons will be accompanied by one of the dragons of the dragon clan, as a friend and a battle partner. We, the dragons, have found the next summoner of the dragons. W who? 
Naruto asked, timidly. At Naruto's words, the old dragon chuckled slightly. Child, our leader and I have chosen none other than you to be the next dragon summoner, Ryu said, happily, in human tongue. Ryu laid his dragon claw staff on the ground beside him and removed the old scroll from his back, setting it in front of Naruto. The scroll was rather large, but tattered and withered, colored slightly yellow form old age. Ryu kneeled down and opened the scroll, rolling it out to a blank spot. There were hundreds, possibly thousands of names written in the row of boxes that lined the entire width of the scroll, but four of them stood out, for they were glowing a bright blue color. Naruto noticed that the first and last of the names on the scroll were glowing, as well as two somewhere in the middle of the names, vastly spread apart from each other. Ryu looked down at the scroll and pointed to the first name on the scroll. You see how many names are on this scroll? He asked. Naruto nodded. And you see the ones that are glowing? Naruto nodded again. Well, you see, many, many people have signed this, having even the slightest possibility of actually being able to summon the dragons, but only four, the four names you see that are glowing, were actually able to summon them. Let us see if you are one of those able to summon the dragons. Ryu explained. Naruto nodded. How? Bite your thumb and sign the next empty box with your blood, then, dab blood on all of your fingers and press them onto the scroll below your name. I'll instruct you on the rest, later. Naruto nodded and did as he was told, signing his name as neat as a six-year-old possibly could, then placing his fingerprints onto the old scroll paper. Naruto looked up at the older dragon. Now what? Ryu smiled. You know what chakra is, correct? Naruto nodded, he had learned about it in the academy. Well, do you know how to draw upon it? Naruto nodded again. But not very well he muttered meekly. Well, dragons use a similar energy, known as Kai, Kai or Kai in Chinese, which is spiritual energy. Can you try to call on a small amount of chakra? Naruto nodded and focused on his hand. There was a spark of light blue energy, but it only remained for a few seconds before disappearing. Ryu nodded, okay, you got the chakra, now, try holding it for more than a few seconds. Naruto nodded and tried again. This time, Naruto's hand began to glow with the same light blue energy, and it stayed for about two or three minutes. Very good, child, Ryu said. Now, do you know the hand seals? Naruto nodded again, remembering them from a book he had read. Good, now, focusing chakra into both of your hands, do the following seals, then slam your hands into the ground, okay. Naruto nodded. Okay, the seals are Tatsu, Seru, Inu, Yuma, Tora, Tatsu, Tora, Tori, Tatsu, Inu, Tatsu, Ryu instructed in human tongue. Naruto nodded and preformed the correct seals for the dragon summoning. He slammed both of his hands onto the ground, an odd complex seal formed, and, as the seal disappeared, there was a poof of smoke. When the smoke dissipated, there was an egg. The egg shell was light blue and had swirls of white decorating the shell, twisting and wrapping all around the egg's ovate shape. Ryu smirked at the boy. Looks like there is a fifth dragon summoner, Ryu said, now, come here, boy. Naruto nodded, standing up, he walked over to the older dragon. Ryu placed his hand on the small boy's head and began another ancient incantation. Summoner of the dragon soul purer than even the whitest snow he who shall hear the call of the dragon and speak the dragon tongue. Naruto looked at the dragon oddly. What just happened? Ryu chucked deeply. Tiled you speak not in the language of the human as you are accustomed, but in the tongue of dragons. Just remember to speak in you human language when you speak to those of your species. Naruto nodded. Hi. Now Ryu said, bringing his hand up to the whisker marks on Naruto's cheeks, these are the markings of the demonic fox clan the Kitsune, they are also one of the reasons the people of your village hate you so him. I could do something about these, if you wish. Naruto looked up at the green dragon in awe. You could really get rid of the whiskers, you could make them go away so the villagers don't curse me for them. Ryu nodded and then began yet another of his ancient incantations. Angels in the heavens above demons in the hells below creatures in the forests that surround this place, heed my call of distress and remove this mark of a demon from this vessel here. It was all over in a flash of light and then, the markings of the demon fox, Kaiubi no Yoko, leader of the Kitsune clan, had disappeared from the young boy's face. Afterward, Ryu reached within his kimono and pulled out two things. The first was a golden chain attached to a forest green crystal, and the second was a small glass container of a light blue ink-like substance. Ryu placed the necklace around Naruto's neck and opened the container of ink. He reached within the container and dabbed the ink-like substance with his claw. He reached up to the boy's face and with the ink, created two small triangular markings on the boy's cheeks. Tiled, these markings show that you are both the summoner and a member of the dragon clan, wear them with pride. Naruto nodded and looked down at the forest green crystal of the necklace. What is it for? That crystal will allow you to talk to me anytime, anywhere in case you ever need my held, child, Ryu said, smiling. Naruto grinned. Take care child, and take care of your little hatchling when it does hatch. And don't tell anyone that is untrustworthy about this meeting. I'll see you kid. 
And with that, Ryu disappeared in a poof of smoke, him, his scroll, and his staff. It was as if he had never arrived there in the first place. Nothing to show it, except for the egg, the necklace, the markings, and the renewed happiness that shone within Naruto's eyes. Someone cares was Naruto's last thought before falling unconscious. Dragons, like most other creatures, had stages of life. First, an egg was laid by the mother dragon, and then it hatched into a hatchling. The period of time in which a dragon was a hatchling varied from different species and types of dragons and the individual dragon themselves. Some types of dragon were hatchlings for a few months or years, but others could be considered hatchlings until they were 50 years old or more. The high priest of the dragon clan, Ryu no Hidakuri, himself, was a fire element dragon that had been a hatchling until her was nearly 25 years old, and the leader of the dragons, Sundakuro Hikari Haim, was still barely adolescent at her current age of more than 500 years of age. After growing into adolescence, from the hatchling stage, the dragon would begin to mature more, with horns growing long and sharp, scales hardening, and spikes becoming sharper and more defined. Adolescence could last as long or longer as the hatchling stage of dragon development, once again depending on either the type or species of the dragon and the individual dragon himself. After growing from adolescence, a dragon would become a mature adult and pretty much stop growing. By the time the dragon becomes an adult, they are old enough to bear children and breed, as well as fight efficiently. Dragons, depending on the type, species and condition of the environment, could either bear children through laying eggs or through live birth. This makes dragons even more of a complex species, beyond the comprehension of a normal human. It had been five days since the meeting between Naruto and Ryu. So far, Naruto had not revealed himself to the public, and because of this, many of the villagers though he had truly died from his injuries, and they celebrated it. The Hokage Saratobi himself had grown worried and was beginning to believe that the rumors of the blonde's death were actually true. Naruto, now Whisker Mark Less, had gone into hiding. His new home, if you could actually call it that, was a small tent-like structure made from dirty old sheets that he had erected in a dank alleyway in a part of the Kanoha village that could be compared to the slums or the ghetto. It was practically abandoned, except a few drunks and orphans here and there, and had most likely been forgotten by most of the village by now. It was close to the edge of the village, near the village walls and the forest that surrounded it. Naruto had remained in the same place that he had been left for the first two nights, but hearing the whisperings of the villagers, he had decided to leave. He had been very sad in the fact that most of the village had celebrated his so-called death. He had began to wonder if the Hokage, the one man that actually, if only somewhat, cared about him, had celebrated as well. He had cried himself to sleep on the first night, and on the second night, tears hitting the crystal given to him by Ryu, he had contacted the Elder Dragon. Ryu had talked to him via the necklace and taught him several techniques and how to use both chakra and kai, as well as how to take care of the baby dragon that was due to hatch soon. And, during the third morning, he had taken the egg that contained his new partner and took to the rooftops, heading toward his new home in the slums. Now, it was the morning of the sixth day. Naruto was just now rising from his slumber. He peeked out from under his sheet tent and stared at the sky. The sky was a canvas of oranges and amethysts, with small purple clouds dotting the horizon. The sun was only half risen, meaning it was pretty early. Naruto smiled and looked toward the dragon egg that he had summoned days before. It was going to hatch soon, he could feel it in his blood. Saratobi was the Sandame Hokage, trained by the Shadame and the Nidame, Sensei to the legendary Sanin, and the professor of the Hidden Leaf. Saratobi was the man who had battled the ultimate evil for almost half of his life. Saratobi, the summoner of the Ape Clan, genius of the Leaf, masterer of every non-clan technique in all of Konoha, was worried. It was not war, poverty, or any other major issue that most leaders would have worried about. It was a person, a person not even remotely related to him. It was just a child. A child hated by most of the population of the Hidden Leaf Village, Yuzumaki Naruto. Naruto had gone missing on the night of October 10, the child's birthday, five days before, and no one had seen him since. There were many rumors floating around, and the villagers had begun to cheer about the death of the demon. Saratobi had begun to worry that the rumors of the child's death were true. Had Naruto truly been killed in a mob attack? Was the child really dead? Was the youth's life taken so early by the Shinigami? Why hadn't the fourth wishes been realized by the village? Had the villagers really thought so little of their precious leader as so not to honor his last wishes before death? Many thoughts clouded Saratobi's head as he continued on fighting the ultimate evil known as paperwork. He absently wondered, how had the fourth done it? Naruto munched on a loaf of stolen bread. Normally, he would have never stolen food, but he was hungry and had had nowhere to go, and the stores always priced their food so much higher, especially for him. The bread had just been sitting out on a windowsill, a little further into town, just begging to be stolen. Everyone knows that you are not supposed to leave things like pie and bread cooling on your windowsills that was a no-brainer. Naruto looked over toward the dragon egg. When will it hatch? 
He wondered, but that's when he noticed it. The egg was, ever so slightly, glowing with a pale, swirling aura with small white wisps coming off from it. It was very faint, and any normal person probably wouldn't have noticed it. Slowly, the ovate object began to vibrate softly, but that did not last long. Within seconds, the vibrating turned into small tremors rocking though the elliptical item, and as seconds passed, the tremors got rougher. Slowly, small, hairline cracks formed in the thick, smooth surface of the egg, and they became thicker and longer, until, finally, a large chunk of the top half on the egg tumbled to the ground, and two glowing orange eyes stared at Naruto from the darkness within the egg. The hatchling's head peeked through the top of the egg. Slowly, the small hatchling brought up a black clawed hand and slowly made its way out of the blue and white egg shell, still covered in goo from within the dark depths of the thick shell. The dragon was small, barely seven or so inches long, with a snake-like body. Its scales were smooth, light azure in color, with dark blue markings accenting the entirety of the small dragon's body. Its hind legs were the same dark blue as its markings, and each of its four feet were ended with pitch black claws. Its front legs were thin and frail, and its front claws looked like a mixture between a cat's paw and a human hand. It had three digits, each with a black claw and a long, sharp dew claw at the dragon's elbow joint. His hind claws had only two digits, also tipped with sharp black claws, and had a dew claw on the back of the dragon's ankle. Between all of the dragon's toes was a thin but strong membrane that served as webbing, most likely for swimming. The dragon had a small, dull, black nub near the base of his skull, barely growing out of the hatchling's scaly skin. Growing along the hatchling's muzzle and back were thin, flexible spikes, ending halfway down the dragon's tail. The muscles around the spikes could contract if the dragon felt threatened, making them stand on end, much like a scared kitten's fur. The dragon's tail was long and whip-like, with a thin purple spade-shaped membrane fanning out from the tip. At each of the hatchling's shoulder blades, a four-inch long hand-like appendage stretched upward. The appendage was made up of thin, frail bones with flexible joints, four digits came off of the main bone, with a thin webbing stretching over the bones. At the small dragon's chin, three spikes grew, purple webbing stretched between each of the spikes. Naruto stared at the dragon. The dragon stared back. All was silent for many seconds, seconds that seemed like hours. Finally. Hui. Naming a dragon was a very important thing. It took thought in order to do so, based on the characteristics of the hatchling, or a family coat or something of the sort. Simply naming a hatchling something like Tatsu or Ryu would have been stupid, like naming your human baby Gaki or kid, perhaps naming your dog puppy because it was at a time. Dragon names were, more often than not, very long, Ryu no Haidakuri was an example of such a name. Some names were short but with a great impact, like the legendary warrior of the dragon clan, Dairayu, meaning Great Thunderstorm. Dairayu had been the partner of the last dragon summoner, but that was beside the point. Sometimes, within the dragon clan, great ceremonies were held in the honor of simply naming a newly hatched dragon. These parties could last for days on end, and it was not unusual for more than one dragon hatchling to gain their name on one such occasion. When a dragon summoner would name a dragon hatchling, they would often not have such a luxury of having one or more dragons to back them up on the naming of their hatchling partner, and the names of the dragons were, normally anyway, not as long as the dragon named hatchlings. After spending two whole hours with his new partner, Naruto realized something. Baby dragons were just as needy, if not more so, than a human baby, and he didn't know what, exactly, dragons ate. He had tried to contact Ryu, but Ryu had laughed at him and said that he would have to figure it out himself. By now, he had all but gone crazy from the cries of the baby dragon. Once more, he couldn't understand a single word that the dragon cried out, despite knowing the dragon language. Boo -ow -oo -oo. The small blue dragon cried out, chibi tears in its closed orange eyes. He had tried calming it down, innumerable times, but failed, terribly. He offered it a piece of the loaf of bread he had pilfered earlier, left over from his breakfast, but it pushed it away with its clawed hand. He offered it a smooth, shiny pebble, to play with, maybe, but the results were the same. He pondered what it could possibly want, but his mind kept pulling up blanks. He sighed, it was decided. He would have to see the old man, even if he didn't want to. He stood from his former position and stretched his aching muscles. Swiftly, he picked up the hatchling and took to the rooftops, toward the Hokage's office. Saratobi sighed, barely able to see over the massive piles of paperwork that lay on top of the old oak desk that had been in the office since the days of the Shadim Hokage. Absently, he wondered why he had yet to choose a new successor, after the fourth had died, more than six years ago was the village ready for a new leader. All of these thoughts seemed to float in the old man's head, but one other thought kept popping up, even when he did not want it to. Yuzumaki Naruto was he alright? Was he even alive? What had happened to him on the night of his birthday, no one had seen him since then. Some of the villagers had celebrated this fact, thinking that the young Jinchuriki had died for sure. Saratobi just hoped that the child that he thought of as a grandson, like his own grandson, Kanohamaru, was okay. 
Sighing again, Saratobi began to work again, scribbling down his signature on each and every paper, barely reading the words printed on each document. From outside that old man's office, there was some racket, but the old man paid no attention to it, engrossed in his paperwork. The Anbu stationed outside of the doors of his office, guarding him, began to shout something, before all fell silent. Slowly, the doorknob began to rattle, turning ever so slowly, though the old man seemed not to notice. The door creaked open, an eerie sound emitting from the rusting hinges. Old man Siratobi looked up then, and only then, his old grey eyes widening. Hello. Siratobi sensei. Naruto was rushing toward the Hokage Tower as fast as his short malnourished body could take him. He cradled a young dragon hatchling close to his skinny body, half covered by his baggy, blood-stained black shirt. The hatchling was still crying, or whimpering, or whatever the reptilian creature's calls were called. Naruto tried to keep a straight face as he pushed onward, though, inwardly, he really wished he would die if it meant that he would no longer hear the annoying noises emitted from the dragon's body. Jumping from rooftop to rooftop, at an insane speed compared to the speed of most six-year-olds, Naruto arrived at the Hokage's office, sitting on the windowsill. He peered through the window. There were two figures within the room, one was the Hokage, barely visible through the mountains of paperwork, and the second was an odd-looking white-haired man. The man's mane was white as snow and very spiky, long too. It was collected into a long, but messy ponytail ending at the old man's ass. The man's eyes had small, beady pupils, and had crimson markings running from the bottom of the man's eyes to the edge of his jaw. The man's choice of clothing was peculiar to say the least. He wore fishnet and a pea-green guy, a red and yellow happy coat over it all. To top it all off, on his feet, he wore high wooden Jetta sandals, and on his hands, metal hand guards. On this forehead, the peculiar man wore not a village hit I-8, but an Oni hit I-8 with superscript one or a bumi, meaning oil printed on it. He was a big man, with broad shoulders, and an odd grin on his face. Overall, Naruto noted, the man looked pretty much like a kabuki actor. Naruto watched the two for a few seconds, wondering whether or not it was okay to enter the room, and whether or not the kabuki man was a trustworthy person. Sighing indecisively, Naruto decided it was now or never he carefully slid open the window and slipped it. It has been said that the Dragon Clan was a very secretive, as well as selective family. They only revealed their existence to a select few, and only allowed even fewer to actually summon them. So, if three people in the world knew of the Dragon Clan, one of those three would be the summoner. In addition to that, there was only a chance for a summoner every generation, so there would never be two summoners at once. Only when one summoner died would a new one arise, and even then, it was very rare to find a being so pure as to be able to be accepted by the contract and the dragons, connected to the said agreement. And it took a very, very pure-hearted kind person to be able to be accepted by the king or queen of the dragon clan. There was only one exception to this rule this would be the container, or Jinchuriki of the Hachibi no Ryu, the eight-tailed dragon. Hachibi had once been a high priest of the dragon clan, but had become evil and corrupt with power, and was cast out of the dragon clan. Upon his departure, several of the corrupt dragon's loyal followers had come along, thus a second, evil dragon contracted was formed by the eight tail, only to be used be his Jinchuriki or a human he found especially corrupt. Naruto stood in the center of Saratobi's office, a small bluish dragon sitting on his head in a nest of golden hair. Two pairs of eyes stared at the child, one pair, the eyes of the man Naruto mentally referred to as Kabuki Man, staring at him wondering who he was, and the second pair, the pair of eyes owned by the old man staring at him in utter shock. Neither man knew what to think of the small, malnourished child in front of them, nor the odd reptilian creature atop the blonde child's head. The creature, Naruto noticed, had stopped crying on the run over, completely obliteration his entire reason for coming. High sighed and waved his right hand. There yo? Is that Naruto? Saratobi wondered, he looks different. The whisker marks of the Kaiubi have disappeared from his cheeks and have been replaced with triangular makings similar to the Inuzuka clans, only they are blue instead of red. How odd. And in addition to that, he has a strange creature on his person, like an odd lizard, a reptile of some sort. It has wings like a dragon. Saratobi's eye widened at his own mental remark. Dragons as a child, Saratobi had heard many rumors of the dragons and the dragon clan from his teachers, teammates, villagers, and the occasional traveler or merchant. He had always loved the stories these men had told him as a child, even if some of these stories were gross exaggerations of the truth. He had, at this moment, remembered the tale of one traveling monk. The young Saratobi, about seven or eight years old, possibly slightly older, stood in front of an old, bald man with a long, white beard. The man wore a deep red kimono, the color of blood, and had a long, wooden cane he used to walk with. With his eyes closed, the old man, a monk, told the young monkey child a tale. You see, child, long, long ago, when this world was young, a great serpent guarded this part of the land. Behind him, the serpent had many followers who did everything on his whim. 
But this was not enough, for the world that the serpent protected was ravaged with war and poverty, so the serpent made a decision. He said, my world is being destroyed by its own inhabitants, and I, myself cannot stop it. There is only one thing that can I will choose one of their kind, the humans, to represent us within that world, and one of our kind to help him along the way. Ah, but this human cannot be one who will become corrupt with power, nor one who is corrupt to begin with, no, that will not do. The human must be of the purest heart, and only so, as shall be the one of our kind chosen. Yes, it is so, one human of pure heart, and a young of our kind, shall save the world that I protect. And with that, the serpent sent one of his subordinates, another serpent known as the high priest out to find a human of pure heart and bring him or her to their leader. No less than a week later, the high priest returned with a small blonde boy and said to the serpent leader, I have scoured our entire land, but have only found one of a pure heart within all of the corruption of the land. He is a mere child, Millard. The serpent shook his head and replied, he shall suffice, for it is known that even small things can do something big. The serpent moved aside and gave the scared body an egg, telling him to protect and save the world with it, and the boy did just as he was told. Even generations after the boy and the serpent he was given died, his legacy lived on. For in every generation, the high priest of the serpents would scour the land in search of a pure soul to become a protector, who would be able to become partners with another serpent, thus the legend lived on, even though it was rare for one of such a pure soul to be found. As the years went on, the legends morphed, the protectors soon became known as the summoners, and the serpents became known as dragons. Still, every generation, after a summoner dies, the high priest searches the lands for another. The young Siratobi made a face at the old man and retorted. How do you know, old man? The old monk simply chuckled, as a long, red creature slithering up his neck. He began to walk away, and as he did, he uttered something. I lived my life that way, child, he said as he disappeared into the mist. The kabuki man, Jiraiya of the Sanin, simply wondered who this child was. He noticed that the child looked a bit, a lot, like a former student of his, but brushed it off of a coincidence. He also noticed the markings on the kid's cheeks, triangles blue in color he had seen them somewhere before, but where where he didn't remember, and did not feel like straining himself trying to think of it. In life, there can be many hardships. Being shunned by your whole village and being treated like a demon is one of these hardships. One hardship that every single human goes through is sudden changes. Normally these occur around the early teen years and are known as puberty, but the changes I am talking about are not those. What I am talking about is sudden changes in personality or appearance that confuse others and make them think that you are someone that you are, in fact, not. And it is these sorts of changes that are harder for the people around you to get used to, much more so than yourself. They ha ha Naruto laughed nervously at the two old men's stares. They hadn't even blinked in the last two minutes and it was beginning to creep him out a little. I mean, pfft, suuri. It wasn't every day that an orphan boy that less than an hour ago, you wondered if he was dead, walks into your office, through your window, without you even noticing with a dragon of all things perched on his shoulders, but still. The young blue hatchling chirped happily at Naruto, either not understanding their current situation or not caring. Naruto was not completely sure. Suddenly, the kabuki actor-looking old guy spoke up. Who are ya, kid? It was, in all honesty, a very common and blatant question, but Naruto resisted the urge to sweat drop. This old guy must not be from around here if he didn't know who the resident demon was. Naruto sighed deeply before bowing, something Ryu had taught him to do to show respect for an elder or a stranger, and politely as her could being a homeless orphan, and all replied. Sorry, sir, he resisted the urge to call the kabuki man old man, but I am not at liberty to tell you my name if you do not tell me first. It is only polite to do so before asking another his or her name. Hiraya looked at the brat with amusement. Saratobi, on the other hand, was confused and very surprised. Who are you, you couldn't be the Yuzumaki Naruto. What have you done with him? Siratobi burst out. As a reply, the blonde boy simply looked at the elderly Hokage oddly before saying, I am Naruto. Siratobi inspected the boy, his old grey eyes running over the petite child's malnourished form. Prove it. Naruto sighed once again, he put his arms up toward his neck, pulling the hatching off of him and placing it on the floor. Slowly, he placed his index finger upon the crystal around his neck and closed his slightly less bright cerulean eyes. Ryusama. What is it Naruto-kun? The elderly dragon asked through the telepathic powers of the crystal. I wish to summon you to explain myself to Siratobi Jiji and some weird-looking old man. Ryu sighed at the child's reply and answer. Fine, fine. But next time, you're on your own, kid. Ryu rumbled his voice fading. When Naruto opened his eyes, he looked toward Siratobi, then to the kabuki man, his eyes finally setting on the blue dragon hatchling. He kneeled down and picked up the hatchling, placing it across his shoulders. He looked up to see the questioning look in Siratobi's eyes. 
coolly, he said, all of your questions will be answered in a mom. Naruto was unable to finish his statement, for in less than a few seconds, the room became icy cold, and then heated what seemed like several hundred degrees, and filled with smoke. As the smoke cleared a large figure came into view. This figure was larger than even the tall and fat Kabuki man, easily more than seven feet tall, and his skin was tough and green, looking more snake-like than a normal human skin. His eyes pierced through the vast amounts of smoke, an evil-looking and very intimidating glowing red. He had spikes growing from his neck and spine, and a tail, also lined with spikes. Not to mention two large appendages that no human would have large, leathery wings. Naruto looked upon the creature, noting that he was wearing something a little bit different than what he had been wearing the last time they had met. Instead of his lavish royal blue kimono and his tattered old scroll, he wore something a little more laid back for the creature donned not traditional robes, but something that looked more like pajamas. The lizard man, as Naruto sometimes mentally nicknamed him, wore a bathrobe, purple in color, with odd purple lambs dancing all over the fluffy surface. And in his hand, the older dragon held not his staff, but a fluffy, red-furred teddy bear with a single bead eye and a slightly tattered right arm. Naruto giggled slightly, he must have caught Ryu-sama while he was asleep. And Naruto wasn't the only one laughing. Saratobi was chuckling lightly, and the kabuki man was rolling on the floor, laughing his ass off. Ryu glared at Naruto through wine-colored eyes before blushing slightly in embarrassment and tucking the crimson teddy bear, deemed Chichi-chan by Ryu, long, long ago, within his purple robes. Glaring at the other two elderly men, the dragon cleared his throat. This is Uzumaki Naruto. Ryu noticed the confused looks he was getting from the elderly humans. They had not understood what Ryu had said, for he was speaking in the tongue of the dragon and not their language to them, his words had been, this is ist Uzumaki Naruto. Ah. Ryu bowed slightly, beginning to speak in the men's native language. They're sorry, Ryu started, I have forgotten that you humans do not speak in my native tongue, so I must speak in yours. As I said before, this child before you is, in fact, Uzumaki Naruto. For the past few days he has been under my tutelage. Ryu looked back at Naruto, noticing the blue hatchling, looks like your hatchling is doing pretty good, she looks pretty healthy, he said to Naruto. Naruto nodded, not questioning the use of the word she, simply noting that this meant that the hatchling was a female, not a male. Ryu started again, looking directly at the older, slightly withered Hokage. A few days ago, I found Naruto half dead. I had been monitoring him for a few weeks now, him and a few others, searching for the next summoner. He had barely any life within him, so I healed him. I also allowed him to sign a contract with my clan, being the clan's high priest, I was allowed to, as well as remove the demonic traits formed from the demonic influence that was placed upon him, replacing it with the marks of the clan that I hail from. Saratobi was very surprised, while well, Jiraiya, the kabuki man, Jiraiya, was deep in thought. So this is Uzumaki Naruto. That means he's the one that Minato chose as the Kyubi's container. That also means that he's Minato's and Kashina's son. Anyway, I leave Naruto-kun in your hands for now, don't screw it up, you old farts, ja. And with that, Ryu disappeared. Naruto looked at the two older humans in the room, noticing the odd looks on their faces. It was as if they still did not believe him and were still a bit confused about the whole situation. Well, it was mostly the elderly Hokage, in fact, the Kabuki man looked like he was in deep thought. Ag, Naruto groaned. The female hatchling chirped rather happily at her partner's current misery. Naruto sucked in his breath and bellowed loudly, I am Naruto, damn it. The end. See you in the next video.